According to a recent study, up to half of U.S. cities will depopulate by the end of the century due to climate change. This is a huge change for the United States, which has mostly been about growth up till now. Now, the question you may be asking yourself is, will my city be one of them? And how does this study work anyway, and should I believe it? Well, not to worry. We'll go through the details of the study together today, and as a permaculture urbanist, I'll share some additional perspective on how cities and individuals can respond to forecasts like this. Welcome to Edenicity. Best Practices for Sustainably Abundant Cities. Let's get into the study. The first thing that caught my eye was how much depopulation we're talking about. Anywhere from 27 to 44 percent of the populated area. Just imagine that. If you're still in one of these cities, walking outside and a quarter to a half of all the houses and businesses are boarded up or worse. Now, the study does go into some detail about what this would mean for a residence in these cities. But first, let's have a look at its methods. The study used census data from 2000 to 2020 to plot the actual population changes at high resolution in the United States. And for me, the thing that really stands out is that most of the big cities grew, and most of the places that lost population tended to be small. And of course, this is not zero sum. There was net growth throughout the whole United States during this period of time. So far, so good, right? The study is fully within the realm of facts at this point. But here's what it did next. It looked at several different models of how populations might move around due to climate change and determined which ones fit the trends best. These are the shared socioeconomic pathways that have been used in climate modeling by the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC. Now, I made the mistake of going to that report to try to gain some insight on the shared socioeconomic pathways, or SSPs. And at first it didn't seem too daunting, but when I got into the details of the report, I found numerous volumes that were, in the case of the WG1 here, a couple of thousand pages long, and a little bit short on details about the shared socioeconomic pathways. So after a bit of digging around and basically getting the story from these and the documents they referenced, what I realized was that Wikipedia actually covers it pretty nicely. When you follow this link to the SSPs, it walks you through them in a really understandable way. And I've summarized them here. The most extreme pathway has carbon dioxide tripling by the end of the century and doubling by mid-century, which would be pretty horrendous in terms of storms, droughts, floods, wildfires, and dust storms. And it's controversial because some researchers claim it is the best fit to the actual climate data to date, while others hold that it is the most extreme narrative that has been constructed to date, and we shouldn't take it too seriously. But in the study that we're looking at, it's SSP4 that turns out to be the best fit to the data. This was the inequality scenario, which is also called the road divided. And so it's just highly unequal investments in human capital, social cohesion degrades, the globally connected energy sector diversifies with investments in fossil fuels and also alternative energy, and environmental policies focus on local issues around middle and high income areas. In other words, the rich world gets their act together, but completely ignores the rest of the world. That seems to be the scenario that best fits the actual population changes in the U.S. between 2000 and 2020. But oddly enough, not only does the study mostly leave this out, but the IPCC report generally ignores this scenario as well. What seems to be getting the most attention, and what this study focused on the most, was SSP2, the middle of the road scenario, where CO2 falls after 2050. The Wikipedia narrative for that is, the world follows more or less a gradual path toward a more sustainable future and less carbon emissions. But here's what the study predicted. This is a map of that SSP2 scenario for 2100. And as you can see, there are some larger cities that are depopulated, but mostly it's the much smaller towns that are facing depopulation. And they did do one plot of the SSP4 scenario. So this would be the inequality scenario. And you can see that that depopulated a lot of big cities. But again, this is not the scenario that the rest of the study will focus on. The rest will focus on this, which it turns out is bad enough. It goes into some of the large trends. It has a number of kind of interesting graphical ways of representing some of the trends that it observed. And I actually found the graphics a little tedious to work with, so I will skip that and summarize 
them for you at the end. One of the other things that the study did was look at the effect of immigration on city populations. And when they plugged that in, it turned out that immigration was enough to bolster the populations of Chicago and Long Island and really much of the country. So immigration came to the rescue and saved us from depopulation almost throughout the country. So the important points that were forecast are that over half of U.S. cities depopulate by 2100, including some cities in all regions of the country. They predicted that high-income, car-dependent suburbs would grow in all regions, and there would be more growth in the South, the West, and in dense, low-car urban areas in the Northeast. So these would be areas that are well-served by public transit. The study also found that immigration maintains growth in areas like Chicago and Long Island, and that there would generally be more depopulation in the Northeast and Midwest, mainly in lower income areas. The study goes on to say that these changes would mean higher taxes to serve the growing dispersed populations as the suburbs continue to sprawl. Depopulating areas, meanwhile, might struggle to maintain water, roads, electricity, and internet infrastructure. So we could be looking at a lot more places like Flint, Michigan, or Jackson, Mississippi, which ran into severe water problems over the past decade. As stores close and roads degrade, aging populations in particular would be stuck in food deserts with little to no mobility. In addition to what the study pointed out, I feel it's my duty as a permaculturist to note that we have already lost half of Earth's biomass because we occupy half of the surface of the Earth. Yet, with more sprawl, car dependence, and roads, we would certainly face more habitat destruction and more extinctions. But the real question is, is this inevitable? The study used trends from 2000 to 2020, when, according to the U.S. Census Bureau, a third of in-state moves were retirees. These are the generations that were most sold on cars and suburbs, and also the generations with most of the money. So they were driving the economic decisions to develop in the patterns that were observed by the study. So in a sense, the study is just looking at the numerical fit to the data derived from some different narratives of how we might respond to climate change. It's just basically trying to read the tea leaves, the numbers themselves, but forecasting in this way has its limits, because even though the narratives that it tried to fit to actual population growth were forward-looking, the growth itself was backward-looking and based on assumptions that are starting to crumble in society today. And moreover, when we try to forecast the future, there's this famous quote that's been attributed to everybody from Abraham Lincoln to Nelson Mandela, but probably was from Dennis Gabor, the Nobel laureate who invented much of modern holography back in 1963, who said, the future cannot be predicted, but futures can be invented. So the real question is, what other futures are being being invented and chosen. According to this USA Today article, between 1983 and 2022, the number of 16-year-olds with driver's licenses declined from about half to a quarter, and at the same time, 18-year-olds with driver's licenses dropped from 80% to 60%. So that 16-year-old figure is pretty amazing. We have half as many 16-year-olds getting driver's licenses today as back in the 1980s. And according to this article by the National Association of Realtors, every generation since the baby boomers has been more interested in living in walkable neighborhoods and would put a premium on being able to do that. And according to the American Public Transportation Association, home values were up to 24% higher near public transportation than in other areas. So it's clear that trends are in flux right now, but what should also be clear is the future is ours to choose. And a future worth inventing is one where people choose cities that are mitigating and adapting, especially if they're facing threats from climate change, which I covered in depth in the prior episode. I'll put a link at the end. And for most of us, that looks like choosing cities and pushing for policies within your city that mitigate and adapt to climate change and generally make them more resilient, better places to live. There are some really nice articles in Wikipedia on climate change adaptation and climate change mitigation. But the main mitigations I would focus on are renewable energy, which produces less carbon dioxide than fossil fuels, transit-oriented development, abbreviated TOD. This is mixed-use multifamily housing built on or near transit hubs. And finally, urban agriculture, which shrinks our land and energy use. Adaptations would include shrinking the urban heat islands by reducing the amount of pavement. And again, the best way to do that is through transit-oriented development. 
We could also use urban forests to provide shade and buffer floods and droughts, along with natural drainage basins. This would include naturalizing and daylighting creeks, which are often channelized or buried for convenience. Go ahead and screenshot this if you need a quick reminder of the key policy issues. But a lot of people have been asking what they can do if they don't live in a dense urban area. What to do if they live in the suburbs or out in the country? Not to worry. I'll cover that in this episode next week. And in the meantime, YouTube thinks that you'll enjoy watching this one. And if you want to get a sense of the big picture of the overall Edenicity strategy for urban development, have a look at the Edenicity reference design, which I've linked in the description below. Take care, stay green, see you next time.